Okay, hi folks, this is the last part, part three of our series looking at the 2024 National 5 Physics written paper, that's section two. And as usual, we're going to the Calder Glen High School Physics webpage, clicking on National 5 Physics Resources, and then scrolling down until we see National 5 SQA Pass Papers. And then when that opens up, it's the first one in the table there. Make sure you click on paper two and remember the whole paper is two and a half hours so i've done the multiple choice in a separate video and then we've looked at the written questions at section two over three separate videos so this is the last part and we're starting at question 11. It says a wave energy converter is a machine anchored to the seabed that changes the kinetic energy of water into electrical energy and the wee diagram of the wave energy converter floating on the surface of the water and is anchored to the seabed. In part A says water waves are transverse waves. State what is meant by the term transverse wave. Well, your answer has to talk about the oscillations or the vibration of the particles, or in this case that's the water molecules, and those vibrations are at right angles to the direction that the wave is travelling. A little diagram here might help us as well. So I can sketch a little transverse wave. There's the particles oscillating vertically and the wave travelling at right angles to that. Moving on then, part B. An engineer uses a stopwatch to measure the time taken for one complete wave to pass the end of the converter. The stopwatch is started when a crest passes the end of the converter and stopped when the next crest passes and the time measured by the engineer is 7.4 seconds. And in part one, we've to calculate the frequency of the waves. So straight to your relationship sheet, frequency is the number of waves per second, or the number of waves divided by the time taken. And in this case, we've got one wave that's produced in a time of 7.4 seconds. And that gives us a frequency of 0 0.14 hertz. Three marks. That's a bog standard three mark calculation. You could also have done it using the alternative relationship. The period of a wave is equal to one over the frequency and then rearrange that. So F equals one over the period, which in this case is one over 7.4 seconds. Same answer, 0 0.14 Hertz. And then 11 part B part two suggest how the accuracy of the frequency of the waves determined by the engineer could be improved. Well, if he measured the time for more than one wave, then he could do the number of waves divided by that longer time and you would get a more accurate measurement of the frequency of the waves. Part C, the average electrical power produced by the converter depends on the wave height. And on that diagram, the wave height is measured from the very top, that's a crest, to the very bottom, that's a trough. Watch out for that. And the graph shows how the average electrical power produced by the converter varies with wave height. And then we have to use the graph to determine the average electrical power produced by the converter when the amplitude of the waves is 1.5 meters. Now remember, amplitude is measured from the middle to a crest, but the wave height in this diagram is measured from the top to the bottom. So the amplitude will be half of that wave height. So if we've got an amplitude of 1.5 metres, then the wave height is going to be 3 metres. It's going to be double that amplitude. So if we look at a wave height of 3 metres on the graph, and we read off what the electrical power will be, then that corresponds to it's about 480 on the y-axis there. So the average electrical power, we better write that underneath, 480 kilowatts. Just one mark there. That's pretty tricky. 11 part D. The wave energy converter is now moved to a position behind the harbour wall so it can be serviced. And waves travel towards the harbour wall as shown. And we have to complete the diagram to show the pattern of wave crests beyond the harbour wall. This is a diffraction diagram here. So we want to show the waves still having the same wavelength, the same distance between them but they are curving around that obstacle, curving around the harbour wall there. So make sure you've got the same wavelength, 
but they bend, they diffract around the harbour wall. Two marks there, one for showing that it's a constant wavelength, and one for showing the bending of the waves. Alright, moving on, scrolling past a few blank pages here. Question 12 says, While at a firework display, a student sees a flash and hears a bang from each firework explosion. And the student states, Measuring the time between seeing a flash and hearing a bang will allow me to calculate the distance to the firework when it explodes. And we have to state what additional information is required to calculate the distance between the student and the firework when it explodes. Well, if you've measured the time and you want to calculate the distance, then you're also going to need the speed of sound in air. One mark there. Part B, the student takes a picture of a firework exploding using their mobile phone. The firework produces red light and the camera in the mobile phone uses a lens to focus the rays of the red light onto a sensor as shown. Oof, convex lens there. 12B part 1, explain why the ray of red light passing through the centre of the lens does not change direction. Well, that's because the ray enters the glass at 90 degrees. And you can see that on the diagram, the middle one of the three parallel rays is hitting the surface of the lens perpendicular to that surface, and therefore it's travelling along the normal, and it's undeflected. Part 2 says state whether the frequency of the red light in the lens is less than, equal to, or greater than the frequency of the red light in air. Well, frequency doesn't change, the number of waves per second doesn't change, so the frequency is the same. And then part C, at one point during the display, the student moves to a position near a tall building, and as a result, now hears two bangs from each firework explosion. And we have to state how the amplitude of the second bang from each explosion heard by the student compares to the amplitude of the first bang from each explosion heard by the student. Whew, that's quite wordy. In other words, what's the difference between the two bangs that the student hears from a single firework going off? And notice, on the very bottom line there it says, you must justify your answer. And what that means is you can't just have a guess here. You can't just say, well, the second bang will have a smaller amplitude than the first one. Even though that's correct, you would still get zero marks because you haven't justified your answer. A justification has to be a statement that backs up your answer and includes some relevant physics. So, let's think firstly why the student hears two bangs. Well, when the firework goes off, some of the sound is going to travel directly to him in a straight line. That's the first bang that he hears. And then some of the sound is going to reflect off of the building and reflect back to him. That's the second bang that he hears. That's what we would call an echo from the building. And that second path is going to travel further than the first one. And as a result of it hitting off the building, it's going to lose energy on reflection there. So the amplitude of the second bang will be smaller than the first one as it's travelled further, it's travelled a greater distance and it loses energy on reflection from the building. Hmm, that's pretty tricky. Okay, question 13. Uh-oh, it's a using your knowledge of physics question. I think we'll leave that till the end and we'll come back to it. It's an open-ended question. So we'll move on to 14. Question 14 is a radiation question. It says, medical face masks can be sterilised using gamma radiation to kill bacteria. The masks are placed into sealed plastic packages and these packages are then placed in a steriliser where they're exposed to gamma radiation. And then we've got a couple of diagrams there. I don't know how helpful they are. Anyway, part A says, the gamma radiation is produced by a cobalt-60 source and the source has an initial activity of 848,000 gigabecquerels. Well, that's pretty radioactive. And its half-life is 5.3 years. And we have to determine the activity of the source 21.2 years later. Well, whenever I get a half-life question, I do what's called the two-row method. In other words, you draw a little table that's got two rows in it. In the first row, we're going to put the activity, that's in gigabecquerels in this case, and in the second row, it's the time, and that's in years. 
and then we can put in what the activity was at the start when time equals zero and in this case that was 848,000 at the start and then it will fall to half its original value that's 424,000 in 5.3 years and then it will fall to half of that 212,000 in another 5.3 years that's 10.6 then it'll half again, 106,000 after 15.9 years, and then it'll fall to 53,000 in 21.2 years. So every 5.3 years, it falls to half its previous value. So after 21.2 years, the activity is 53,000 gigabecquerels. And you don't need to put the units in the table, you just need to put your units in at the very end. Okay, question 14b. The face masks receive an absorbed dose of 25 kilograys to ensure that they are safe for use. That's quite a big dose. And the mass of each face mask is 2.2 times 10 to minus 3 kilograms. Part 1 says the masks receive an absorbed dose of 0 0.50 grays each second. And we have to determine the length of time in seconds that the masks remain in the steriliser. And this is only worth one mark. So all we're doing here is we're taking the total absorbed dose and dividing it by the absorbed dose per second. So 25,000 divided by 0 0.5. And that gives us a time of 50,000 seconds. Wow. That's nearly 14 hours. Well, we have to do it in seconds. That is the answer. Just check that with the SQE marking instructions. Yep, pretty long time. Then part two, calculate the energy absorbed by each face mask. This is a three marker, so we need the relationship. Dose equals energy divided by mass. The dose was 25,000. That was the total absorbed dose. And we have to work out the energy absorbed. Uh, divide that by the mass, and the mass was 2.2 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. 2.2 grams there. And then if you rearrange that, then E is equal to 25,000 times 2.2 times 10 to the minus 3 gives you an energy that is absorbed of 55 joules. Moving on then, question 15. It says, read the passage and answer the questions that follow. Well, I'm not going to read it. You can pause it and you can read it if you like. But basically, it's about spacecraft that use a nuclear fission reaction as their power source. And part A says explain why solar cells may not be a suitable source of power when exploring distant parts of the solar system. Well, as you move further from the sun, the solar energy available to the craft will decrease. It's one mark there. And then we have to explain why the decay of plutonium to uranium is described as a nuclear fission reaction. Well, nuclear fission is when a large nucleus splits into smaller parts, and that's what's happening here. Our plutonium nucleus is decaying into a uranium nucleus with the emission of an alpha particle, I believe. So it's emitting particles. In other words, it's splitting to become a smaller nucleus. This is only one mark here, so let's have a look at the SQE marking instructions, see what they're looking for. And all they're looking for is that the larger nucleus splits into smaller nuclei. Hmm. Okay. 15 part C. Describe the role of neutrons in the nuclear fission chain reaction. Well, neutrons that are released from one fission reaction will go on to split further nuclei and that in turn will release further neutrons which will go on to split more nuclei and so on so neutrons released from one reaction go on to split other nuclei and cause further fissions one mark for each of those statements in part d voyager 2 has been traveling through space for nearly 50 years and we have to explain why the power output of the RTGs, that's the radioisotope thermoelectric generators, if you had read the passage, on Voyager 2 have decreased over this time. Well, the activity of the plutonium that's used in the reactor 
will have decreased over a period of time, over those 50 years. And in fact, the half-life of the plutonium was given in the passage. And it's there, the half-life of plutonium-238 is 88 years. So it's going to be about half as radioactive as it was at the start. So therefore, the power output will have decreased over that time. And that is the end of the question paper, although we still have one open-ended question to do. We said we would go back to this at the end. So let's see how we got on with this, if you're still awake. Two students are discussing their radiation. The first student states, all radiation is dangerous, so we should never allow ourselves to be exposed to it. And the second student states, no, it's only nuclear radiation that we need to worry about. And using your knowledge of physics, comment on the student's statements. Well, because there's two statements there, we should really talk about both of them and include as much of our knowledge of physics as we can. So firstly, we could say that not all radiation is dangerous. Radiation means that something, either particles or energy, is emitted from a source. And sound and heat radiation are safe at low levels. At high levels, sound can damage your hearing and infrared radiation can cause burns. But if we talk about nuclear radiation, now nuclear radiation including electromagnetic radiation, for example x-rays or gamma rays, it can be harmful if you're exposed to it for a long time or if the level is high. And I could put in my little diagram showing the penetration power of each of the three types of radiation, alpha, beta and gamma. My alpha particle is a little helium nucleus there, two protons and two neutrons. A beta particle is a fast-moving electron. And our gamma ray is high-energy electromagnetic radiation. And I can show the alpha being stopped by paper, the beta by a few millimetres of aluminium, and the gamma being reduced by thick lead. And then we could talk about the harmful nature of ionising radiation, the fact that alpha radiation causes the most harm as it's 20 times more likely to cause ionisation. This is when atoms lose or gain electrons to become ions. And of course, ions are bad news for living cells. I'm then going to draw a little atom here, it might be a carbon atom. And then an alpha particle comes along, it's not got any electrons. And then when it passes close to your normal healthy atom, it can steal two electrons from it. That turns your alpha particle into a helium atom, but it leaves your carbon atom with two fewer electrons, and therefore your carbon atom has become a positive ion. And ions in your body can kill or damage your biological cells. Now again, would that get me three marks? I don't know, but make sure you put in as much of your knowledge as you can. Okay, that's it for the 2024 written paper. That was a bit of a marathon. And don't forget, if you're looking for any of these past papers, they're all on the Calder Glen High School National 5 Physics page. And I've done walkthroughs of all the multiple choice papers here on YouTube as well. So, best of luck with your exams. We'll see you in the next one.